verse number 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. He said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Brother Rob, if you can turn me up just a little bit in the monitors in the house, I'd appreciate it this morning. Thank you so much. These verses that we have read this morning, I have preached from many times. In fact, uh, last year on a Wednesday night, I preached a message from these verses. But this is the next scene in the life of our Lord that I want to look at this morning. If you have an outline there with you, you're going to note that the introduction will be much longer than the message, all right? So take hope in that assurance. In verses 1 and 2, we find there is a wedding in our verses. The Bible teaches us, and the third day in the marriage of Cana of Galilee, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now, what I want to do in this text, I want to give you the story give you what's going on, and then at the end I want to draw out just one thought that we'll make some application to. Weddings are meant to be a joyous occasion. Some people like going to weddings. I am not one of those people. Do I have a witness in the building? The only good thing about wedding is food. And those little, how many of y'all know them little mints they always have at weddings? Those little, I don't know what, I, I call them wedding mints. Those are the only good things about the wedding. Because usually at a wedding, you have to see people that you're kin to that you don't like. Somebody talk to me now. And weddings and funerals, it brings out people you got to see that you don't like, all right? Don't look at me like that. You've got somebody you don't want to see, you just avoid them too, all right? Just how it goes. It's the reality of it. And weddings can sometimes uh, be some funny things. I remember when me and Grace first started dating and uh, one of the... Th- I hate to say it like this. I enjoyed being a pastor's son. I grew up in a pastor's home, and I enjoyed that. But there's two things that I did not enjoy about being a pastor's son and being able to sing a little bit is I sung at every wedding, and I sung at every funeral. It didn't matter if I knew the people. It didn't matter if I liked the people. It didn't matter if I even wanted to. I had to sing at every wedding and sing at every funeral. I prefer singing at funerals. I sung with Brad Paisley and Dolly Parton and Vince Gill. Now, they was not there. They were there by way of recording, but I just leave recording, but I leave that part out. You did not know I was so famous. I have literally sung because he lives in between go rest high on that mountain and when I get where I'm going, okay? It is not a redneck funeral unless they sing go rest high on that mountain. And then it's not a redneck wedding until somebody gets up and sings that stupid song, You Are the Wind Beneath My Wings. I mean, it's just some of the goofiest things. And I'll never forget the first time me and Grace ever sang together was at a wedding. And it was one of them weddings where my dad was trying to help this couple out. They probably shouldn't have got married. In fact, the reason I know that is they didn't stay married. And I'll never forget, we sung that night in the wedding, and we're down there in the fellowship hall. And now my wife, when we got married, she gave me specific instructions that if I wanted to live, that I was not to smash that cake in her face. Any other husbands get that speech? Well, apparently that groom did not get that speech. 
He took that cake, and you know, doing the picture, he shoved that in her face. Well, when he did, she lost it. She jumped up, screamed at him, ran out of the fellowship hall, and what made it funnier was the bride's mother ran out yelling at the groom. Oh, it was great. It was great. They got divorced a few years later, uh, shockingly. My point is weddings are to be exciting and to be joyous. And in Bible days, it was a whole lot more dignified than the redneck weddings I've been a part of. It would actually be they would get married and they would have a seven-day feast where all they would do is eat and, and fellowship and have a party celebrating this marriage. I mean, it was exciting. That is what's going on in our text. The Bible teaches us that this third day references back to John chapter 1 where God, where Jesus called uh, to Philip and Nathaniel. This is three days after this event. Most Bible commentators agree uh, that Nathaniel was from the city of Cana. And so the reason that Jesus was invited to this wedding it is possibly somebody in Nathaniel's family that's getting married. We notice that Jesus approves of marriage. Jesus was asked to be at this wedding, and Jesus attended this wedding. So there's the wedding in verse 1 and 2. Then there is the wanting in verse number 3. The Bible said, and when they wanted wine. Apparently a couple things could have been. Apparently the caterers did not judge the crowd that well. Uh, apparently uh, maybe they uh, drank more than what they thought. You know about an embarrassing situation to run out of food. To run out of food for all these guests that you have. It is commonly agreed that Mary, the mother of Jesus, she is somehow uh, running the wedding, running the food, because she goes to Jesus and lets them know that they have a deficiency. We notice the woman in verse 3 and 4, that being Mary, the mother of Jesus. She said to Jesus, they have no wine. Verse number 4, Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Now let's just stop, stop and talk about that for a second. Jesus is not being disrespectful to his mother in this verse. In fact, three and a half years from this scene when he's dying on the cross, he will look down at his mother and say, woman, behold thy son. That was a term of endearment in that culture. It is not a term of endearment in this culture. It is not a good idea to look at your mother and say, woman, because if you do that, I'm going to have to preach another funeral and sing at another funeral. And I hate doing that, all right? It's just, it is not customary. And but Eric, it is not culture for you to look at Delane and say, woman, because then I'd have a double funeral. Uh, and so that is, that is not cultural. So let's get that down. But that was a term of endearment in that culture. Woman, and, and I have wanted to ask that question. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Uh, but it's not wise nor advisable, okay? So he is saying, you know, what do you want? She knew that Jesus could do something about this situation. I, I, don't, I don't believe that she knew he had miracle work and power as far as because she had seen him do it. But she hasn't forgot that an angel came and told her he was going to be the son of the Most High. She hasn't forgot about those wise men and those shepherds coming. She knows that he is the Son of God. And so she has faith in him. And aren't you glad we can trust him this morning? I know I'm not getting a preaching gear, but I'm giving you the best I got this morning, all right? And so this woman, she, we notice the wisdom in verse 5. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Boy, that's some good wisdom right there. That's a good word of, uh, of, of advice right there. She looks at those servants and says, I want to tell you right now, whatever my son, whatever he asks you to do, you do it. You know, he, he, he asked them, we'll look at it here in just a moment, but he asked them to fill the water pots with water. Now, those water pots, uh, they, they contain about two or three firkins apiece, the Bible said, and, and so they are... They are large, about 27. The Rock of Ages Study Bible, I was looking at my notes, the Rock of Ages Study Bible uh, tells us that these water pots were about 18 gallons, and so they're, they're pretty good size. But Jesus has not asked them to make wine. He's not asked them to go and pick grapes, to rinse and remove the stems, to mash the grapes, to cook them, to strain them. He's not asked them to do that. All he has asked those servants to do is to f put water in those water pots. You know, we complain a lot of times about what we have to do. He's not asked us to do anything hard. He's just asked us to be obedient to Him. 
And I want to remind us this morning that obedience is the secret to the Christian life and how we need to be obedient and how we need to follow God and how we need to be obedient to Him in the life that we are living. This is good wisdom that she's given. And by the way, that'd be good advice for you to follow this morning. Whatsoever He saith unto you, do it. Whatever God speaks to you about, or whatever God wants you to do in life, you need to be obedient to Him. Then we notice the wine, verse 6, 7, and 8. I've got to deal with this. Did Jesus turn this water into an intoxicating beverage? There's an argument that says that he did. They'll say that they'll use the verse down uh, in verse number 10 that every man hath well drunk. Well, the Bible didn't say when men are drunk. It said when men have well drunk. And so what is this? Well, let's think about this. This miracle is interesting. And y'all still with me? It's just as a glorified Sunday school lesson, all right? But it's the best I got. This miracle is interesting in our Lord's ministry because he don't lay his hands on the water pot. He don't speak any words. He does not pray a prayer here. He does not do anything out of the ordinary. In fact, this is just an unusual miracle. But this is the first miracle he did. I want to say this this morning. The Word of God is very clear about the consumption of alcoholic beverages. The first time the word wine is used in the Bible, it is used when Noah planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine of that vineyard. The Bible said that he uh, got drunk and that he got naked in his tent. You don't get drunk off grape juice. And so this wine here, wine comes from the vine, a seed grows the vine, a vine produces a grape, grapes are turned into a drink. This is the process. of It requires soil, sunshine, time, and labor. But Jesus bypassed all that and made water become wine in that little white part of your Bible between verses 6 and 7. The word wine in the Bible, this is where I want to get to, and then I'm going to give you my thought and quit bothering y'all with my voice, all right? The word wine in the Bible sometimes does refer to intoxicating beverage. But then sometimes it doesn't. Well, preacher, how do we determine... How do we deter- Boy, I love y'all because y'all ain't expecting me to perform. You're just wanting to book, and I appreciate that. Some places I go, they want me to jump and run, and I just can't do that this morning, all right? But some places, how do you tell when it's an intoxicating beverage or when it's the grape juice? The context. Who's doing the talk? If I, were, if, I were to ask you, if I were to ask you this afternoon, hey, tonight after church, let's go out and get something to drink. Well, you know me. You know I don't drink alcohol. So you know that means we're going to go down somewhere and get a Coca-Cola. We're going to get something to drink. But if somebody you work with that you know don't live for God, you know drinks, they ask you to go, hey, when we get off work, let's go and have a drink. You know they don't mean a Coca-Cola. You know they don't mean a Dr. Pepper or a milkshake. You know they mean an intoxicating beverage. In fact, uh, this, this, these verses here, Proverbs 23, look not upon the wine when it is red. When it gives this color in the cup, when it moves itself aright, it's, that word when is talking about the process of fermenting. So this grape juice that our Lord made, this wine, it was not intoxicating. It did not turn. It was not moving itself aright in the cup. And I would say this this morning. The Bible said that it is a sin. Woe to him, Habakkuk 2.15. Woe to him that giveth his neighbor to drink, that putteth the bottle to him. It is a sin not only to drink alcohol, but to serve alcohol. Amen. Preachers used to preach. I'm feeling pretty good now. I don't feel bad. I just can't talk. Preachers used to preach years ago that a Christian ought not even work at a convenience store or a grocery store that sells alcohol. Why? They would use that verse, woe to him that put his drink to his neighbor's lips. And so we've got to be careful about that. We've got to be not among wine members. So here's my point I want to make. Had Jesus turned this water, Brother Clayton, into an alcoholic beverage, then he would have sinned. Then he would not be the Messiah. He would not be the Son of God. And his death on the cross would have been a fake and a fallacy, and we're all going to hell today. You see the importance of the Scriptures in implying that Jesus did not make an intoxicating beverage. Had he done that, we would be lost in our sins for eternity. 
is very important this morning. That's the wine. And then in verse number 9 through 12, there is the wonder. Oh, by the way, let me give you this. Verse 11, he said that this brought glory, manifested forth his glory. Do you think God would have got glory over people getting drunk? Drunkenness leads to nakedness. I, I got a lot of verses. I'm out reading Proverbs 23. I don't know if that's in your notes or not. Proverbs 23, verses 29 through 35. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentious, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that seek mixed wine, look not upon. He gives all those warnings of that. God is against alcohol. He's against your rock and rye, too. Some of you old-timers know what that is. That rock and rise where they take that rock candy and Jack Daniels and honey and lemon and mix all that together for their cough. My grandma used to make it. My uncle walked around with a perpetual cough. He's just always coughing, coughing, wanting some of that cough syrup. Some of y'all got to put castor oil. Somebody said, well, that can stop you from coughing. No, it'll make you scared to cough, all right? <laughs> Thank God those days are over, amen. And y'all fussed at us uh, for drinking out of a, a green water hose, all right? And y'all took castor oil, okay? Leave me alone. But there's that wonder. They, they take, they obey the Lord. I'm getting to my thought, really. I'm, I'm going to get to my thought and we'll get out of here. They take that, that, that cup to the feast, to the rule of the feast, and he drinks it. And it's a wonder. He said, most people set out the good grape juice first, the good wine first, and leave the bad to last. But you've kept the good until now. Now, we preached all that before, all that, all that before. But there is a part in this story that I've often overlooked that I want to emphasize for about the next seven minutes this morning. And that's the water pots. These water pots, they, as I was studying this this week, these water pots stuck out to me. There's something interesting about these water pots. I, I thought about these water pots. They are a picture of you and I this morning. I thought about their denomination, not their Baptist or Methodist, but the denomination, the mathematical term. How many water pots are there? There's six. In your Bible, six is the number of man. Man was made on the sixth day. There are six letters in the book of Romans. In the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, it is talking about the, the, the war of man in the flesh. In the sixth verse, in the sixth word is the word man. And so there's a lot of cool little facts right there. A lot of people die over that stuff, don't like that kind of stuff. I'm just saying the number six represents man in the Bible. Their denomination, their description, the Bible said, in verse number, verse number seven, uh, verse number six, rather, there were six water pots of stone after the man uh, of stone. That's the description. That sp stone pictures the hardness and the coldness of man's heart. Then their defilement. The Bible said they were sitting there after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. What are these water pots there for? They're there for the washing of hands. People would come by. Now they think that sanitary. But I'm reading that saying they walk by and everybody sticks their hands down in these water pots to wash their hands where 25 other people just stuck their hands and washed it. Don't sound too clean. But these water pots are full of defilement because of somebody else. You know, that's the way we are as humans. Wherefore, it's by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. So death is passed upon all men for all have sinned. So these water pots picture you and I. And I want to preach on this thought for just a few minutes this morning on what can Jesus do with water pots. What could Jesus do with water pots? Or what could Jesus do with somebody like me? Because this morning, I'm just like those water pots. I, when I was lost without God, I had that heart of stone. I was cold. I was defiled. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus, when he was going to do a miracle, uh, Jesus, when he was going to do something, he looked towards those water pots. Three things in the text, and I'm done. First of all, there's the consideration of the Savior. He, he, he considered those water pots. The consideration of the Savior. Aren't you glad that Jesus thought about you? When you were hard, when you were defiled, when you were a sinner lost without God, his perception in this text, he saw those water pots. 
He saw them where they were at. He saw how dirty they were. Amen. I wish I could preach it like a fella. He saw how dirty they were. He saw how everybody had used them and abused them and they walked on by. Didn't think nothing there. Just stuck their hands in and walked by. Everybody had, uh, had put their defilement. Everybody had, had treated those water pots wickedly. But he saw it. He His perception. But then his plan. Oh my. He saw those water pots and he had a plan for them. Amen. He had a plan in mind for them. And aren't you glad that Jesus, he looked beyond our faults and he saw our need. Amen. His perception and his plan. But then his purpose in this text. He had a purpose for these water pots. What was the purpose? The purpose was this. I can do something with that. Aren't you glad Jesus looked beyond your fault and he saw your need and everybody just saw old dirty water pots. That's, that, I hope you're picking up what I'm laying down. Your life is that dirty water pot. And Jesus saw you and said, I can do something with that. I can make a difference. I can make a Sunday school teacher out of that. I can make a choir member out of that. I can make a church member out of that. I can make a daddy out of that. I can make a mom out of that. I can do something with that water pot. The consideration of the Savior. But then number two, the command to the servants. Now I love this now. We know that Mary has already told those men, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it, right? So Jesus looks at those servants. They're unnamed servants. We don't know who they are. But watch this now. He said, I got some, there's some water pots over there. Here's what I need you servants to do. I need you to take the water to them. Well, y'all didn't get it. There's some dirty, defiled water pots over there, and I'm going to do something with them. But I need somebody to take some water over there. Water in the Bible is a picture of the Word of God. So there are some unnamed servants that Jesus put on their heart and told them, there's some water pots over there, and I need you to go over there and take the water to them. So you know what they did? They did what Jesus said. They took their little bucket, and they went over there, and they started pouring water in the water pots. This took time. It took some time to do that. This took toll. It took some work to do that. And it took travel. They're having to go back and forth, back and forth. But you don't find them complaining. You know what they're doing? They are servants. They are to do what the master tells them to do. The, you know, may not get this, but you know who those servants are? They're them faithful gospel preachers. Yeah. Amen. God said there's some sinners over there, and I want you to carry the water. Can we thank God? This I'm not talking. I ain't saying thank God for me, but let's thank God for those people uh, that bring water to the thirsty, bring water to those that defile. You know what I am this morning? I'm just a water boy. I'm just toting the water around. Amen. Brother Richie, this morning, you know what? He's going to the prison because there's some water pots in there. And the Lord needs a water boy uh, to carry the water to the water pots. Amen. You know what? The missionaries we support. Uh, God saw, wa saw water pots in Honduras. So he called Gene Trask to be a water boy and carry the water to the water pots. Amen. All those other missionaries. Brother Carl will come by. He's just a water boy. He's just pouring water in the water pots. Thank God for those that carry the water. Amen. You ought to thank God for that one. By the way, you don't have to be a preacher to carry the water. You know what you're doing? You know what you're doing when you when you go out and you pass out uh, one of these gospel tracts? You know what you're doing? You're, you're carrying the water to somebody. You're giving the water to somebody. You're being obedient to what the Master has told you to do. I thank God for all those water boys in my life. All those ladies that brought me the water in Sunday school. All those preachers that preached me the Word of God. Amen. Thank God for that this morning. Thank God for those Sunday school teachers. It took time to teach the Word of God. Heard a preacher say this. He said, I can't remember all my school teachers through my high school and elementary school education. He said, but I can remember every one of my Sunday school teachers. You testify about that? You remember your Sunday school teachers, those that took time and taught you the Word of God? You know what they were doing? They were just glorified water boys. The consideration of the Savior, the command of the servants, and then last of all, the change of the situation. This water was turned to wine. This change was unexpected. That governor of the feast wasn't expecting that water to be made wine and taste that good it was unexpected and you know what people walk by and they look at your life now and they say 
Boy, I never expected you to be in the choir. I would have never expected you to be a Sunday school teacher. I would have never expected you to get up and give a testimony. Why? Because that change in your life that Jesus made was unexpected. They never would have thought on a Sunday morning you'd be in church with your family and with a Bible in your hand, but that change was unexpected. That change was unbelievable. You know people that look at your life and say, it's unbelievable. You're, you know what they'll say? You're totally different than what you used to be. Hallelujah. But if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This change was undeniable. When he, when he drank of that grape juice, he said, this is better now than what it was before. By the way, when Jesus comes by, he always leaves you better than what you was before. Mm. Amen. I wish I could scream right now, but I can't. I may have a designated screamer. Amen. I'm just telling you, he makes an undeniable change. But this change, big word here, but it was unprecedented. Nobody else got the credit that day. The Bible said in verse 11, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. I'm going to tell you what Jesus did that day. When it was over, everybody knew that Jesus was the one that did it. Them servants knew. They knew they hadn't put anything special in that water, in them water pots. All they did was pour the water in. Now watch this now. Brother Charles, they poured water in, but what did they get out? Wine. Wine in your Bible is a fruit of the Spirit. A picture of the fruit of the Spirit of God. You know what wine's a picture of the Bible? Joy. And one of the fruit of the spirits is joy. So watch it now. Them water pots before, they're full of dirt, filth, things we don't want to think about, especially right before lunch. Everybody's hands have been in there. People have laid their hands. They've also cleaned utensils in there. Ain't that nasty? And then they wash their hands in that? It's nasty. But they didn't have COVID-19 back then, so maybe they were on to something. I don't know. Just defiled and dirty. But when Jesus got on the scene, when them servants poured the water, you know what came out of that water pot that was dirty and defiled? Joy. Joy. Joy wasn't there before. Joy had never been in that pot before. It was a water pot. It wasn't supposed to have joy. But now joy is coming out. Joy is produced of it. Joy is coming out. You know what? Now, if you're saved by the grace of God, you got joy in your heart now. Why? Because Jesus moved in and Jesus made a change. I also say this in closing. Come on, Brother Matthew. That night when Jesus was in the upper room and he's given, he's instituting the Lord's Supper, Brother Clayton, he lifted up that, that cup, that fruit of the vine, that grape juice. He did not say, this is my joy. That ain't what he said. He said, this is my blood. You know what happened in water pots? They got covered with wine. They got covered with the blood. In fact, we use grape juice to picture the blood of Christ. You know what happened in them water pots? They were dirty and defiled. But when Jesus got done with them, we let me say it, they were covered by the blood. And aren't you glad this morning that you're not what you used to be? You're just an old dirty water pot. You're just old something that everybody else had used and abused and walked away. Nobody even thought two seconds about them water pots. But Jesus had his eyes on them water pots the whole time. He Hey, boy, I wish I could preach. Y'all do too. He saw his eyes on them water pots. And he sent a servant with some water. He said, pour some water in there. And I'm going to get some joy out of there. I'm going to cover them with my blood. And the difference was made. What can Jesus do with water pots? He can make a preacher out of them. He can make a daddy out of them. He can make a church member out of them. I'm glad Jesus makes all the difference. Let's stand. I appreciate your attention as I've stumbled through this this morning. Maybe you just want to come thank God.